Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, it is so great to have you back here with me, joining me for another edition of Felony Friday right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Felony Friday is a weekly show where each and every week we focus on injustice in the criminal justice system. And one way that we do this is by bringing on guests, bringing on guests who have experienced injustice personally in their lives at hands of our criminal justice system. And in this episode, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. We'll be speaking with, I'll be interviewing a doctor by the name of Bertram Russell Jr., And he's going to be sharing his story of how he was essentially railroaded by the IRS and ended up serving five years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. It's a fascinating story, and it's really a tragic story, but I think there are lots of lessons to be learned from it. Now, before I get to introducing Bertram, I do want to let you guys know that you can find the show notes for today's show at lionsofliberty.com slash FF46. This is episode 46, so that is where the FF46 comes from. So please be sure to check those out, and I think we'll be linking to a couple of documents. Bertram was able to get the IRS to submit in writing that he actually did not owe taxes during the years that he was put in prison for not paying taxes for, as the IRS claims, that he was evading taxes. Anyway, we'll get to that in the show. Just one more note before I introduce Bertram. I do want to encourage you guys again to check out IgniteLiberty.us. And at IgniteLiberty.us, you can order Make Liberty Great Again hats or shirts. We have two different designs for the hats and shirts. So I really want to encourage you to check that out. As you guys know, this is an incredibly divisive time in our country. We just had a historic election, obviously, where Donald Trump won, and things are pretty bad, and things are bad between the two sides. I think wearing a a Make Liberty Great Again hat or shirt, it's a great way to bring attention to the ideas of liberty. It's a great way to get someone to ask you a question. You know, someone might, they could mistake you for a Trump supporter, and it's a good in to start talking about the ideas of liberty and how these ideas can help to heal our country. So please be sure to check that out. And for a discount, a 25% discount on all hats, please enter promo code FELONY for that 25% off when you check out. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's show. My guest today is Bertram Russell Jr. Bertram has a story to share that dovetails quite nicely with my last episode, my last two-part episode, with Pete Hendrickson, where we talked about the income tax and Pete's book about cracking the income tax code. Now, Bertram, who goes by the name Skip, so during this interview, I'll probably refer to him as Skip. He is a uh, a doctor and an investor, and he's also a listener of this show. Uh, He's actually the one who tipped me off of Pete Hendrickson's work and uh, sort of got me uh, interested in Pete Hendrickson's book and to have me bring him on the show. Now, Bertram came across... Pete's work while actually doing research on his own case. You see, the federal government had accused him of conspiring to file false returns and of evading income taxes. And Bertram actually ended up serving about five years in prison. And we'll get all the details surrounding that and and the lead up to the case and how that occurred. Uh, Let's bring Bertram on the show. Welcome to Felony Friday. Hi, John. Just for the Felony Friday audience to get to know you, just to little bit better and get some background information of who you are and and where you come from. If we could just start out, if I could ask you where you grew up, and I know you're a doctor, so where you grew up and how you got into the field of medicine. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and I always enjoyed biology in high school and had an interest in medicine and pursued that path, going to Johns Hopkins University and then Thomas Jefferson Medical School, and then I worked in the further suburbs of Chester County after I got out as a radiologist. Okay, so your, your specialty was uh, radiology then? That's correct. Okay, and how long did you practice for? Are you still practicing today? No, my license was taken away when you uh, get a felony. All the states suspend your license. We'll get into that. And I guess we'll, we'll jump around a little bit, maybe talking through the story. I do want to try to Go through it pretty linearly, so it's easy to understand for for the Felony Friday audience. But I do want to start at the beginning, but first, I do want to do want to jump to one spot. Can you just share with the audience what you were convicted of 
and how much time you ended up serving in prison. I was convicted of conspiring to defraud the U.S. Treasury, failure to file returns, evasion of tax, and filing false returns. Uh, I got a 65-year sentence and served just under five years of that. Wow, that, that, is a, uh, that is a long time to spend in prison. And how long ago was that that that, that happened? My trial was in 2009. I was held on 14 months of home confinement waiting sentencing uh, because of co-defendants. And then I started serving and got out about a year and a half ago. Wow. So this is very, very recent. Correct. What prison did they have you? Did they move you around to a couple different No, I went to Hazleton, West Virginia. During your time in prison, was there anything you, you leaned on that got you through? I know you were still sort of fighting the case as you were in prison. No, when you're in a camp, it's very easy, and Hazleton's one of the easiest places to serve time in. A camp doesn't have any fences around it. Uh, you're just contained in a, a semi-walled area, and then all the work on the prison is done by the inmates in the camp. The officers don't do anything other than guard you generally. The landscaping, maintenance, food, laundry cleaning, all that stuff is done by inmates. So were most of the other inmates there um, nonviolent offenders? To be in a camp, you have to have less than 10 years and no violence. All right. Well, let's get back and, and hear your story. Start at the beginning. I think from emailing back and forth with you earlier, this whole thing started back in the 1990s, sort of with uh, some investing you did. So can you kind of start with, you know, I, I know you, you were practicing medicine at the time. You began investing in some different companies. Can you can you share with the yeah. audience how? Not only am I a doctor, my wife was a doctor too. So a condition of having a professional corporation is that all the members would be doctors. So my wife and I formed a corporation. She contracted with a hospital that she worked with, and I contracted where I was. Our corporations contracted, and we both did that for approximately seven years until – her employment changed, or she wasn't employed, but her job opportunity changed, and she went somewhere else. So if we formed another, or I formed another company with another doctor. At the time when HMOs started to become popular, we were going to do self-insurance as well as medical services. The advantage of being in a corporation is tax deduction-wise, you get more than you do as a individual filing. Uh, an example would be horses. If you wanted to do race horses, you have to be profitable in two out of seven years. Otherwise, they call it a hobby and they don't give you any deductions, whereas a business would be able to deduct every year for that. My wife and I had filed taxes every year and we'd actually been audited. And the lawyer that had advised the independent contracting route and incorporating had defended us successfully in all those episodes of involvement with the IRS or anyone else. When my mother died, I inherited uh, some money. So to have better use of it, I loaned it to the corporation. And the corporation was with a contract that was paying it back with interest to be paid after the principal was paid, which was never fully paid back. The corporation invested in different avenues. One of them was a basement waterproofing business. If I can just jump in real quickly, sure. just so I, I understand. So the corporation, was it more than one person or was it? There were two people in it, correct. Me and another doctor. Okay. The corporation in, invested in a basement waterproofing company in addition to uh, doing medical service. The, they contracted with other hospitals or entities that paid the corporation for the services provided. The basement waterproofing business turned out to be a big fiasco in that my identity was stolen and that by the general manager who ran up about $800,000 of bogus debt. Uh, just spending it here and there and managed to get sign up credit accounts and hit all of the payments that came due from me because he would shift around different mailing addresses. 
So I never got them until one day the sheriff started showing up at our house at seven in the morning to serve as papers. And this continued every other day for approximately six weeks. We had no idea what was out there because nobody knew about it. Obviously, the general manager was fired. Nobody wanted to do anything about it as far as solving my credit because he had hit it for six months. And after it goes on for six months, they hand it over to a collection agency who is only interested in making money. So was was this general manager, was he actually – you know, stealing the money. Was he taking the money for himself? Uh, he, he was doing both. He would write bogus checks to people who would cash them and he'd give them some of the money back. He'd expand credit in places, cars he went through using my credit, all sorts of things, a movie theater, advertising, casinos. I think he was spending most of it on gambling or a drug addiction. We couldn't figure out. Nobody knew what was out there until you got served. Nobody wanted to rectify it. None of the billing collection agencies were interested at all in helping us. I defended some of them uh, that pursued me personally in court, and they all went away. But most of them just uh, dwindled away going after me, but then would keep coming back when the account I got turned over to someone else. Can you uh, just briefly explain what you mean when you say the sheriff was showing up and you'll get served? What does that all entail? The sheriff would drive into our driveway at seven in the morning and knock on the door. And when you answer the door, they give you papers and saying, here's service that a suit's been filed against you. And then they drive off. That's all they do is give you notice, basically. Okay. The basement waterproofing business was successful. I was interested in it to begin with because it provides a, a good service for people turning an area that's useless into a useful area. And I knew that because I had waterproofed three basements of my own myself. It made some money, but it was revived as a second uh, waterproofing company when this one couldn't be salvaged. It had so much damage to it. I went along with that for another year and a half and then it wasn't a, a clean business because the salesmen used scare tactics, I discovered. And so I wanted out of it, and they offered to buy me out. And uh, I accepted that they would pay me out over time with money to be held in an escrow account by the same lawyer, unfortunately. And they went on to do their own business. And they grew the company fairly big, being in 12 different states. Unfortunately... They started cheating on each other, and one filed a RICO lawsuit against the other, which brought the feds into it. The feds went back from them into the lawyer who did represent me and also represented them and advised them to be independent contractors, too. They went after the lawyer. They seized all his records and went on to indict 16 of his clients and the lawyer himself. I had had never met 80% of these people or heard of them ever. And that's how the conspiracy gets brought into it. They came back, the government, and accused me of the conspiring and failing to file charges, uh, conspiring with a lawyer to evade and help other people defraud the United States, which wasn't true because when I had the waterproofing business, we used independent contractors to do the installation and the salesmen worked on commissions and only got paid. They weren't employees. The general manager actually did file and claimed himself as having an employee and income. And I never took anything out of the company. So everything was legit as far as I, I was involved in it. But after I left, the other people the two salesmen that took it over did not report employees and called other people independent contractors that weren't, and they weren't clean. But I got dragged into that one. If you'll remember, I continued working as a radiologist, and the company that had contracted, in this case with the University of Pennsylvania, was paying back its loan to me over time as was contracted bit by bit. So they would pay expenses. And I had an accounting company that would keep track of what they paid 
towards what they owed. Since I was getting money back that I had loaned to them and interest was to be due afterwards, it's no different than taking money from your right hand and putting it in your in your left. Or if I borrowed $10 from you at a movie theater on Friday and paid you back Saturday, that's not income or a taxable event. The feds wanted to interpret that as me avoiding evading. Avoiding is not illegal. Evading is. Evading taxes by hiding it from the government and taking that money that was really paid to me, they said, uh, rather than to the company and that I owed all the taxes on it because of that. That's how I discovered Hendricks. And as I tried to learn about, I used a, an accountant and a lawyer because I did, wasn't interested in learning the tax law, although I always did make the lawyer explain to me why something was valid and why he believed that. And he would bring out caseload after caseload and show me. And the, he'd bring out the statutes and the code and court cases. And he'd also represented me successfully before the IRS before. So I believed him. So quick question, if we can backtrack for a minute. So when the federal government starts investigating this lawyer and there's yourself and I guess 16 others that they're investigating, who were they claiming you were conspiring with? Just the lawyer or with the other 16 people? Or Uh, Yes, they don't differentiate that. I was conspiring with the lawyer and everyone else he knew because they tried to say that my pattern was used to be put forward on these other people. And some people weren't even independent contractors. One was some lady who he helped her get a house by renting it out to someone. I don't know the details of it. I'd never met her and I wasn't involved in any of it. So we were all thrown in the same thing. Fourteen of the people pled guilty and three went to trial. I went to trial with this lawyer and a guy from Michigan who I'd never met in my life. And what was your reasoning for not pleading guilty? Obviously, you weren't guilty, but... I wasn't going to plead guilty to something I wasn't guilty of. Mm -hmm. The chances of winning are minuscule. Uh, 97% of cases are pled to, and of the 3% that would go to trial, they win 97% of those at least. Mm -hmm. You were standing on principle knowing that you were going to lose, basically, but... (laughs) I didn't have a choice. I have to look at myself in the mirror every day. No, I think that's very admirable. It is. So that's how I met or ran into Hendrickson is trying to learn about the tax code and the different angles of using the code advantageously. And I discovered him by chance, read what he said. That did arm me for later on because when I did get convicted and went to prison, some bureaucrat made a mistake and sent me a we haven't received your return for one of the – there were five years I was in, they accused me of all this because the loan still hadn't been paid back over that time that I made to them. One of these years, a bureaucrat sent me a letter saying, we haven't received your return, and I sent him a letter back saying, I don't owe your return because of this, and I stated all my facts, and they send you another letter – like they haven't read the first letter, uh, you do owe this, and then back and forth until I managed to get to another higher agent. And I'd learned from Hendrickson to quote, and from going to trial, which I'll tell you in a minute how that skewed against you. I'd learned to present the law that you want and the statutes and the IRS code in your letter because that way they can't deny it or misconstrue it. And if it ever gets brought up or audited, it's there as a record and a judge cannot have it withheld. So I kept sending them the court rulings and reasonings and the IRS code and asking them, what's wrong with this? And eventually, uh, I would insist upon a uh, administrative hearing, which you're guaranteed by due process, by an independent tribunal. A tax court is not an independent tribunal, first of all, because the tax court's judge is paid by the same person as the IRS. And you can't go to tax court if you haven't filed. I wasn't making any income, so I didn't have to file taxes. So and they, the IRS wouldn't file for me. 
So I can't go to tax court to get my day in court. I would request an administrative hearing, and that would be ignored constantly. At one point, I set out my letter how this was not a gain. I quoted the court ruling stating what a gain was and that taxable income was only on a gain. Uh, you can go, go back to an excise or not, but I wasn't even arguing that. I was arguing that it wasn't a gain and it wasn't therefore taxable income. And I quoted my list of cases and the code, and I got a ruling back from the IRS Washington office that you've seen that I had no legal duty to file, meaning that I was innocent. I had also done FOIA requests over this period to get my master tax file, and it has me having zero taxable income and owing zero taxes, even though they've taken me to court accusing me otherwise. Nobody's gone ahead with the IRS and done this because if they did that, they would make themselves personally liable and they know that it's wrong. Would you be willing to obviously redacted, post these these tax documents with this interview saying that you don't owe any taxes? Absolutely. Yeah, you can show them that letter. All right. Well, we'll have that in uh, in the show notes and obviously you can um, ahead of time, redact anything that you don't want in there, and uh, and I'll put a PDF in there in the show notes page. When I went to trial, the biggest shock to me was how stacked it is against the individual. First of all, this is a civil matter. If I stole money from you, you can sue me for the money back is the way you get it. You don't criminally come after me, but the government does it in a different way. They should have taken me to tax court and civilly gone after me for that. But when you go into trial as a criminal trial, the government gets two shots at you at the witness for the one shot that you do. I never realized this, but because you're presumed innocent, the government will put a witness on the stand like they'll bring some woman from Washington, an agent, who will say, I looked at this stuff and I say it's his money and he owes the income. And he avoided the taxes. And then your lawyer can get up there and make her admit that, well, she didn't really, as in my case, she didn't really see my figures. She only saw the figures that somebody else gave her to look at. Well, that gives them all plausible deniability because you can't, they can't be held, you know, liable for accusing you of something. They're just basing their judgment on what's been fed to them by somebody else. In any event, even though she'll admit this on the stand, then the government gets to come back for a final shot at her before the jury and say, ma'am, did these facts this woman showed you? She said, yes, those facts were all honest and accurate, and I'm saying he owes it all. And that's it. You don't get to counter it at all. So you're always at a disadvantage. Every time you might get some upper hand, they get the last say and slap you down for that. I never realized that. Another thing that's true you always hear is don't talk to people. Anything you say to them, you get a perjury charge on it or an obstructing justice charge on it because they accuse you of lying to them. What do you mean by don't talk to people? You always hear them say don't talk to cops or something mm-hmm. like that that's, that stop you because – the cops, they'll use it against you. It's worse with the Absolutely. feds. You always see in these movies, two people go out to interview anybody on law and order. Well, that's because they don't record it. One agent takes it home and at some time later writes his recollection of what went on and what was said. And the other agent verifies it. That gives them plausible deniability again, because if they had a record of it and you listened to it, there'd be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm-hmm. So they all get to – they write their reports and they're skewed in their favor that way also. When you go into court, I wanted to bring in – and so did one of the co-defendants – all the material that we had relied upon to make our judgment. The court cases, the uh, the rulings of the IRS, the Internal Revenue Code, and – the federal regulations and the judge wouldn't let any of it into the courtroom. The prosecution objects because they said it would confuse the jury and the judge says, I'll agree with that. Well, I'm not stupid and I tried to do my due diligence and I was confused by it if it's not true, but I think it is true, but he won't let any of that stuff in. Anytime you object to something, the judge would say, well, that's my ruling, and if you don't like it, you can appeal it. The only problem is your appeal won't go on for another five or six years, and you have to go serve your time 
uh, most everybody while you're appealing. That's just incredible that we can go back to the judge. So the judge ruling that you can't bring basically this alternate view because it might confuse the jury because they can't think for themselves. That was the prosecution's exact words. There's only certain things they're allowed. That's that's just incredible. Really, they're just giving the judge something to hang his hat on, really. Again, in my appeal, when I got to the appeal, I appealed my case that the documents that you have showing that I owed zero taxes by my master tax file, that I was actually innocent, and that the National IRS office ruled I had no legal duty to file and no income. That was blown off by the counter of the prosecution that said our strict duty was to convince the jury and we did that. And then they threw out a case. And the judge agrees with that and says, I agree with it. Denied. Unbelievable. It's just so skewed against you that you can't. But I would still go to trial again because I'm not pleading guilty to what I'm not guilty of. And intent is a major element of it. You have to intend to commit a crime. If you do it by accident or if you did it with uh, due diligence, it's not a criminal event. Right. So the government was asking you if they were going to offer you a plea deal, if you would have pled guilty, then you would have been lying and saying that you intended to break these laws. One could argue that you didn't even break any laws, but saying that, that you intentionally did this, which, of course, was not the case. True. I would, to plead guilty, I would have to lie. <laughs> Uh, but everybody does it. Which is very, very similar to um, what they're doing to Hendrickson's wife, Doreen, sort of a similar thing where they're having her in order to get out of her, the charges against her, where she's had to spend time in prison. She would have to lie and basically commit perjury. Uh, yes. And she's stuck in that position of having to do that. Uh, I wouldn't lie. They were supposed to – I asked to be have my case segregated from these other people because very few of them were like my situation. They didn't have other family members in the business and they weren't met doctors. The prosecution wanted me kept into the others. I, they wanted me stained by everybody else. Some people had done wrong things, which had nothing to do with me or and weren't like my case, but they said they would compartmentalize everything and keep it simple so that the jury could do it. There was nothing simple about this. The judge agreed with that, obviously. Again, you can contest it if you want, <laughs> if you want to wait, but their way of compartmentalizing it was bringing all these other dirty people up and then throwing me in there for 15 minutes with the same woman saying the same things about me and then moving on to something else. And a lot of these dirty people who actually did end up pleading guilty, they actually did break the law, right? I mean, so. So they said. So <laughs> they said they broke the law, so I'll take them at their word. Yeah. They get you to plead because a similar person to myself who pled got six months. I went on and got uh, four and a half years, and then the judge added a year because he said I lied because the jury found me guilty, uh, even though I – he said I didn't believe what I said I believed, even though I do believe it. You added another year because you – pretty much because you wouldn't accept the plea deal. So – Well, that's not how we – his adding the year was because I committed perjury because I didn't believe what I said. They can't give you a year just because you won't accept the plea deal. Yeah, I know, but that, yeah, that's – because you didn't believe what you said. That doesn't even make sense. Those are his words. Well, he knows my mind, I guess, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. So, now, when you do get uh, – it's tightly controlled when you get convicted of a felony. All the medical organizations drop you. You're terminated from hospital staffs. You get a letter from all of the states where you have licenses. I had licenses in nine states that uh, they are – terminating my license permanently in most of them. I fought it in Ohio and basically they end up just saying, well, you're not the type of person that we want, even though I committed no medical malpractice whatsoever. Right. Well, one thing I did want to bring up uh, before I forget about it, in our email correspondence back and forth, you talked about an offer that you made um, instead of in lieu of serving uh, time in prison maybe volunteering, doing community service on a Indian reservation. Correct. The uh, 
when the government took the Indians' property, they made them wards of the state. And along with that includes giving them health care. You'll find that medical services to Indians are provided from IHS, the Indian Health Services. I had contacted 12 reservations where Indian care is provided. And all the radiology departments there are grossly understaffed. Women there, if they have a breast lump, have to wait uh, nine months, rather, to have it evaluated because they can't get around to it. All the departments wanted me. I was proposing that I spend my five years giving free service at my expense at whatever hospital would accept me. I found one in Arizona, All the others would not accept me because when they got word of my felony, uh, somebody in some department wouldn't want to touch me with a 10-foot pole, whether it be in human resources or medical staff or nursing or chief of the staff. Somebody somewhere along the line didn't want to cross the line with the feds, and so nobody wanted to get involved with me. You see, Medicare, which accounts for 50% of all billing, and any government services, which would be Indian repayments, has a clause in it that they can refuse to pay for any felon. So for those reasons, nobody wanted to gamble with me long term. I did propose this to before the judge that I serve my time helping the Indian reservations, as I said, at my expense. I pay for my own room and board and work for free. This would have saved him over one and a half million dollars of expenses. The prosecution actually said that they were okay with it after some jail time, but the judge said, quote, no way, you're going to prison, be there in 30 days, end quote. And so that's where I went. Yeah, it's just, if that doesn't epitomize how broken our criminal justice system is, I mean, obviously, this entire ordeal shows how broken it is. It's only broken depending upon how you look at it. Yeah, right. It works for the criminal justice system. Yeah, it works for the prison industrial complex. And I'm sure, I think, as you pointed out in one of our emails, that's probably what that judge was looking out for when he sent you to prison. He's not looking to help people or to uh, turn lemons into you know something that resembles lemonade. It's, it's an industry. I mean, you have the magistrates, the sheriffs. The court clerks, the <laughs> prosecutors, prison, as you said, probation afterwards, the FBI, treasury people, IRS agents. It's its a huge industry. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. And it's something that, you know, that's the first thing that needs to change. I think you and I agree that this isn't something that is going to be changed from the top down. Um, I don't think we're going to get elected officials in any sort of uh, near time frame to change the system. This is something that's got to change from the ground up and it's got to change from education. It's got to change from people hearing about someone like yourself who did nothing wrong and was completely railroaded by the criminal justice system. Uh, nine of the 11 people on my jury worked for the government. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> so uh, wow. who do you think they believe offhand? That's quite a statistic right there. Wow. Well, uh, Skip, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show and sharing your story. Is there anything else, any parting words you'd like to give before I let you go? No, but uh, any communications, uh, I would – anything you want to be seen, make sure it's in it because that's the only way that evidence can get into trial. I take uh, the ruling from a court case and what they said was the law or what was considered gain or taxable income, and I'd copy and paste it into my letter. Every letter I sent back to them had – 12 to 20 pages on it. That is sound advice. That's good advice. They can't deny that they didn't see it or they misunderstood it when it's sitting in front of them. Yep. And you can always go back and cite it. That is correct. All right. Well, thank you again, Skip, and have a great night. You too, and keep up the good work for Liberty. What an interview. What a story from Bertram Russell today. You know, his story is eye-opening for several reasons, really. It's a reminder that even though you know you might be going about your daily life and think that you're doing things properly, think you're doing things the right way, and think there's no chance that the IRS, for example, would audit you or come after you in any way. It really is a reminder that that's not the case. And if the government does come after you, if there is something that they have perceived that you've done wrong, 
when you go to court, the deck will be entirely stacked against you. And Bertram followed the law and ended up in a really difficult situation. He was charged by the IRS and he was lumped in with a bunch of other people who were all under this same lawyer. Uh, They were all lumped under the same conspiracy charge. And the crazy part about this thing is the government said that they did it in this manner in order to make it easier for the jury. Um, They didn't want to segregate the cases and they didn't want to segregate the cases. They didn't want to go out of their way to make it easier on Bertram. No, it's to make it easier on them. The prosecutors, once they put charges against you, once they have you in court, they're not trying to make it easier on you. They are trying to get a conviction or they're trying to get a plea deal. And I have so much respect for Bertram Russell here for not going for the plea deal, for standing his ground. And it's easy for me to sit here behind a microphone talking on a podcast and say that I would do the same thing. But it's one thing to say you would do the same thing and to actually do it. And you have to respect Bertram for going through with it, for knowing for knowing that he was going to face at least four and a half years in prison, in prison, four and a half years away from his family, four and a half, and a half years separated from his loved ones. But he knew that he would have to wake up the next day and face himself, and he would not commit to being guilty of a crime that he did not commit. And I'll tell you what, if there were more people like Bertram, more people that had that attitude, that had that integrity, we would not get pushed around by the government quite as easily. I really do wish that there were more people like Bertram out there. And another thing that I just wanted to touch on real quickly, the one aspect of it where Bertram offered, he offered instead of going and spending time in a prison behind bars, he offered to go on a Native American reservation and offer his services as a doctor to Native Americans. And that was turned down. The judge nixed that Pretty quickly, the prosecutors seemed like they were for it, Bertram said, but the judge was against it. You know, that just proves how pointless this system is. Bertram didn't commit a crime, but if he had committed a crime, you know, who's to say that a part of that punishment couldn't be something that would actually benefit someone else? That's what we should be looking for in a justice system. We shouldn't be looking for wasting resources, wasting somebody's God-given talents, skills, It's just maddening to look at it from that perspective, where people that don't have medical care could have had medical care, and a judge stood in the way and said no, all because he's just sold his soul to a broken criminal justice system, and it makes me sick. Not much more to say about it. Really a powerful episode today. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you do enjoy these episodes, one of the things that you can do to help the show the most is to share the show. Share the show with your networks. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, all of your social media networks. If you're not following the Lions of Liberty on Facebook and Twitter, make sure to do that. Also, if you have not yet joined the Lions of Liberty Forum on Facebook, be sure to check that out and join. Uh, we're getting you know close to probably by the time this airs, we'll have over 800 members. There are some awesome conversations going on, especially conversations centered around the election right now with all of the division we have right now in our country with uh, Donald Trump being elected our next president. He is our president-elect. A lot of conversation about that, about that transition, how we got here and where we go from here with the Liberty Movement. So be sure to think about joining the Lions of Liberty Forum. You can join by going to Facebook, typing Lions of Liberty Forum in the search bar at the top. It'll pop up and we will get you approved as quick as we can. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the show, think about subscribing to the show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. And also, if you are subscribing on iTunes and you're enjoying the show, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It really does help us out with all of the algorithms there on the iTunes and will help us to get a better ranking so we can get the show to more people and bring this message of liberty bring this message of criminal justice reform to a bigger audience because that's what this is all about that is why we're doing what we're doing here today so thank you for listening that's all i got for you today this is john odermatt signing off always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning